I hope it's been a help to you. It's been a challenge to me because uh, if you're saved, you love the church and you hate to see what's happened in a lot of places to the church. And it's because of this casualness that we're talking about. And uh, we want to combat that. We, we, we want to fight against that. And it, it's very easy uh, to point the finger and say, well, you know, look at what they're doing and what they're doing. Yep. But I really think that God wants us to look in the mirror to see maybe where we are. Uh, and there are varying degrees, by the way, of casualness. Uh, you might not be far down the road, but if you're headed in that direction, you're heading in the wrong direction. And it doesn't take but a little step in the wrong direction to all of a sudden find yourself away from where you should be. And uh, I, I found this to be the case. If you take one step in the wrong direction, it's easier to take the next one, and the next one, and then the next one. And, and, uh, and we shouldn't want that. Uh, Mark chapter 13 and verse 33. The Bible says this, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, Watch. Watch is the, is the command. We are to watch. That is to be diligent. That is to be alert. That is to be awake. And not only are you watching for the things that are coming in your direction, you need to watch yourself to see how you're reacting to those things. Because they can start to cause you, and we'll look at that in just a moment, they can start to cause you to slip away from where you should be. If you take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 2, please. Hebrews chapter 2. Well, I, I tell you, go ahead and turn to chapter 1, and, and we'll, we'll start there and then jump over. Uh, we're going to see something that I found interesting years ago, that sometimes that God will make a statement, and then He'll use the word, therefore. All right? He's doing that here in Hebrews, but between the statement that's made and the therefore, there are a lot of verses. And we can kind of look at it this way. He makes a statement, and then he explains who he's talking about, and then he says therefore. In Hebrews chapter 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. All right, now, look at chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, everything after that, that phrase in verse 2, He has spoken to us by His Son... Everything after that until we get to chapter 2 is explaining who His Son is. So you can almost look at that like a parenthesis in there. Okay? He's saying, God has spoken to us by His Son, whom He hath appointed, heir of all things, by whom also He made the world. And He goes on to explain all these attributes about His Son. This is what I want you to see. He's spoken to us, therefore... We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. What he has said, we should listen. Not only listen, we should respond to it. We should act upon it. All right? So therefore, he has spoken to us by his Son. Are we listening to what he has said? If we're not, I'm telling you what we're doing, we're becoming casual. Uh, we're not heeding it, we're, we're drifting away from it because the next part of that verse in, in chapter 2 and verse 1, it says this, uh, If you give more earnest heed to the things which you have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Uh, sometimes people, preachers have clever titles for their messages. I heard a preacher preach one time and said, Your slip is showing. 
but he's talking about that verse. The idea that somehow or another, God has told us the truth, but we've let it slip. Now, now you have to understand what this word slip means. Slip means to flow by or to carelessly pass. It's the idea of uh, uh, putting down an anchor, knowing that that anchor will hold you exactly where you want to be, and somehow or another, the anchor is no longer holding. And you think that everything's fine, but then you start to slip. You start to drift away from where you should have been. I guess I could ask this the question, uh, are we still standing where we stood when we started? Or have we, just a little bit at the time, let things slip? If, you, if you've noticed anything at all about, now I'll use it this way, Christendom today, and how that the, the, uh, uh, you see this group over here and, and, and they become an entertainment thing. And uh, uh, another group over here, they've just become so dry and powdery. I mean, it's, I mean, it's just, uh, when I said you were a border, I didn't mean you were boring. All right? <laughs> but it's like, it's boring what they've done. They have what's called dead orthodoxy. It's just, it's religion with no spirit to it. Amen. Well, how did they get that way? You, you slip. And the idea of slipping is to slip away from what Jesus has told us. That's what the verse uh, in ver chapter 1 said. He's spoken to us by His Son. We've let that slip, and now we're going in a different direction, even though probably at the beginning we didn't even realize we were doing that. The anchor just got uprooted, and all of a sudden we're just kind of... And you wonder, how did I end up here? Reminds me of the prodigal son. Do you think when he left home, he was headed to the pig pen? That's where he thought he was going? But he ended up there. How did he do it? I heard a preacher say, one step at a time. And all of a sudden, he finds himself in a place that he did not want to be, in a situation he didn't want to be. How did he do it? He drifted away. And he ended up there. And that can happen. It is happening in our day. Slipping Oh, what? God has spoken. Our anchor becomes uprooted and allows for a drifting away of God. We, uh, we should be standing where we stood. Casualness will let things slip in our life. Amen. You ought to guard them. Now, maybe you don't do this. I, I am old enough to remember when we didn't do this. But I do it now. I lock my doors. Now, I remember a time when you didn't. Uh, I remember a time, shows you how old I am, when kids went outside and played all day long. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And for the most part, mom and dad really didn't know where you were at. They just knew you were out there playing somewhere, and it was okay. Yeah. All right. They knew the time was coming when you could come home. Well, you'd come home. In my case... When I knew supper was ready, I was ready to come home. Yeah. I'm still kind of that way. But you, but you didn't really think anything about it. No. See, our society has slipped, hasn't it? Yeah. And now, what I just told you was a dangerous thing in our day. Yeah. Amen. Well, it's because it's moved away from the way it should be. The passage of Scripture in Hebrews is telling us we have moved away from the way it should be, and the way it should be is what thus saith the Lord. What He has told us that we should, we should live that way. We are drifting. We've already, we've already seen in this study that we are to hold fast, but casualness has lost its grip. And the anchor no longer holds you in the place where you should be. The things of God that you slip away from are far more important than the things you're drifting toward. You see, if God said it, it's important. 
If God gave us commandments, it's important. If God told us to live this way, it's important. And, and if we slip away from that, we're going toward the inferior every time. But the devil tries to betray it as something else. You know what he was really telling Eve in the garden? God's holding out on you. There's something better. Isn't that crazy? I mean, how could you have better than God? In a relationship with God. But the devil's telling Eve, no, that's not really what... God's just holding out on you. I mean, there, there's so much more out there for you. But any time we go away from God, we're going towards the inferior. Every time. There's no exception to that, by the way. None. Now, the devil will tell you there's an exception. But there is none. You cannot do better than what thus saith the Lord. And what God's told us. So we're, we're drifting away from those things. Drifting takes us towards the temporal while the anchor would have kept you in touch with the spiritually eternal. If we'd have stayed there. So, so what is it that we really need in our day to do what God would have us to do? It's real simple. It's what God said, not what man said. And when a church, and by the way it does in the day in which we're living, when it stands on what thus saith the Lord, it's viewed as wrong, out of touch. You just don't understand how, uh, how to draw people. I've, I, I'm sure pastors heard this saying many times along the way. I've heard it. What do you have for the young people? Well, and my answer was always this. I just, it's a real simple answer. Uh, Jesus. That's what we have. Now, do you have... I mean, listen, don't, don't have, we have programs and we have camps and we have all these things that are going on. That's all a part of that. But that's really what we have. I used to entertain you. Then I got saved. I don't want to entertain you now. Oh, we could draw a crowd. But what did they have when they left after we entertained them? Wow. Nothing. And so we have to, we have to start in, you know, taking that as a part of what we're doing or, or else it's not going to work. Well, last time I checked, I thought this church was doing pretty well. Look like to me that we're you know making some progress and and things are are growing and 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 expanding as the Bible uses the term enlarging our coast. How's that being done? I don't think it's being done through compromise, but we have to be careful, or we'll start to become casual. There's so much to do. The Bible tells us that the laborers are few, and that's sad. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be me. As, they, as he's already told us, he said, and all are to watch. All are to watch. Things slip. Now, I'm just going to give you a, a few little things to think about tonight. Things slip when we become casual with the Word of God. When it's no longer the final authority in faith and practice. Now, how does it, if you were ever in a position when it really was the final authority in your life, and you might not be there now in the same degree, how'd you get there? You slipped a little bit at the time. When, uh, when it becomes an option or a matter of personal preference, then it's no longer the Word of God. And you can get to that place. I mean, I know what the Bible says, but this is what I believe. This is what I want to do. This is the way I think we ought to do it. Uh, the, by the way, the theme for the meeting in November in St. Lucia is I will build my church. Now, I promise you this. Jesus Christ will never build His church contrary to His Word. Never. But people are trying to do it all the time. But it's not a church that Jesus is building. It's a church that man's building. 
when it becomes a matter of self-determination. This is what I think it means. The Bible calls that private interpretation and says it's wrong. You say, can we really understand what the Bible says and what the Bible means? Yeah, if you're saved, you can. But you can't if you're not. Only, only the, the, uh, the spiritual man, the man who knows Christ, who has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, can understand the Bible. Right. That lost man can read it and be convicted to be saved. Yeah. But to be able to explain it doesn't work that way. But we get to the idea that there's somehow or another, we, we have this self-determination. Well, I, you know, I, 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 I've just arrived, you know, and I, I can tell you this uh, better than somebody else. Maybe this, is, maybe this is confession, I don't know, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, and, and, and some of you are going to laugh because you, you've been in this position with me so far. There's been a whole lot of times people would ask me a question, and I'd tell them I didn't know. Mm-hmm. Now, when they asked me the question, they were expecting me to know. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. Last time I checked, the only one that knew everything was God. Yep. Right. You know? and, and even though uh, I've studied it a long time, there's just so much I don't know, yep. you know. Amen. Right. But I sure do want to find out. Yep. Mm-hmm. And that's been my goal, and that's what I'm striving toward. We should be the same way. It's not from self determination. I don't want it. I don't want to make it say what I want it to say. Right. I want it to say what God meant for it to say. Right. That's the way I want to learn it. But if you start to be casual with it, yeah. Yeah. you'll start to become a Pharisee. You'll start to become a scribe. And you'll change it and slant it in your direction. That's why all these arguments are going on right now. All these debates. I mean, there's just some things they're debating about. My goodness. I mean, a dumb animal ought to know better than what they're arguing over. (laughs) But they're arguing. (laughs) What I told... uh, (laughs) I told Brother Sammy, he said, I'm going to write that down. Truth settles issues. Listen, you're not trying to, you don't don't need to try to find an interpretation. You need to try to find the truth. And if you'll find the truth, the truth will settle it. When it becomes a dust collector, this Bible, you got a problem. You become casual. I heard somebody say that. Every Saturday night or Sunday morning, you have to blow the dust off of it. Hello. Should not be that way. When it becomes a book of suggestions rather than commandments, you slipped. When it becomes a book of options, you slipped. Last time I checked, we never called it the Ten Suggestions. I'm going to be picking on Sam because we were riding around today, and I said, I learned something since I've gotten to Kentucky that a red stoplight is a suggestion. (laughs) It must not mean what I thought it meant because they're not stopping. And the people behind you that blow the horn at you because you won't go on out in there and get run over (laughs) must not understand it right either. But it's not a suggestion. Things slip when we become casual with the things of God. When we do not hold their place as being sacred. Do you know that when you got saved, something should have happened in your life, and you ought to be cultivating this your whole Christian life. Things should no longer be secular and sacred. Everything about your life should be sacred. Yes, sir. Right. Now, you have to live in a secular world, a material world. That's absolutely true. But everything about the way you approach it should be sacred. Right. Amen. I mean, you're called a saint. The Bible says that now then we are ambassadors for Christ. What does that mean? You represent Him. Right. Right. But when we let things slip, they do not hold their place of being sacred anymore. I can kind of pick and choose a little bit now. You know. uh, I'll ask you a question. Simple question. Are you any less of a Christian on Monday than you are Sunday? 
Well, no. Yeah, but. We kind of act that way. Letting things slip. When the things of God are treated as common, we've let things slip. When we cannot distinguish between worldly religion and genuine spirituality anymore, we've let things slip. When religious activity takes the place of a relationship with God, we've let things slip. It's interesting in the Bible that God was very detailed in how the priests were to perform their duties. God was very detailed in how the people were to approach worship. God didn't change His principles. He did. Uh, if a pastor's watching, he'll come back and straighten all this out. But nowhere in the Bible will you ever find that God said to come in His presence in a casual way. Nowhere. And God doesn't change. God has not become slack or casual in what He expects either. We have. We've become tolerant. I really haven't seen where God does do that. Things, that, uh, things slip when we become casual with the church. Uh, whenever the house of God, by the way, becomes another building, just another building, We've let things slip. Uh, not only should it be kept up in the nicest building in the neighborhood, because God deserves no less, but our approach to it should be the same way. It's God's house. Now, I know the building is not the church. I get that. But we do call this a church building because the church does meet here. It does matter... This building has been set apart, set aside, sanctified in this world for God. And when we get to the place where we approach it casually, we've slipped. Our anchor's been pulled up, and we're drifting away. When the pastor's not respected as the man of God, we're slipping. Now, this is going to be... Uh, uh, Try to help me tonight when we get back to the house, okay? <clears throat> I think what I'm about to say is based on biblical principle, and you may or may not disagree. That's up to you. But I personally don't think there's but one person in this church that ought to call the pastor Doug, and that's his wife. I know some of you have known him forever. I know that. I get that. But he is the man of God. And there ought to be respect to that, I think. You know, Brother Doug, Pastor Doug, Pastor Foster, what, but there ought to... I will tell you this, things like that is the way it used to be. Things slip when we become casual with the church, when it becomes an option that's relegated to a lower level of priority. In other words, I'll come if I feel like it. That kind of thing. When the work of the church becomes someone else's responsibility. Whoever said that, you know, 90% uh, of the work is done by 10% of the people was describing a slipped church. Now, it might have been the norm, and that might be the way it is, but that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be that kind of casual thing. I mean, what does it mean to be a member? What does that mean? 
If you are a member of this local church, does that make you any more saved? No. But it does carry a responsibility for the local church. And when that's not the case, when it's just somebody else's responsibility, then we've let things slip. When we become spectators instead of participators, we've let them slip. So, all right, things slip when we become casual with our standard of conduct. When we think we hold the preeminent position of determining what's right and wrong. Wow. Wow. Uh, when what is convenient becomes more important than what is right, then we've slipped. Uh, when the trends of the world begin to dictate to us the way we live our lives. If you've noticed what's happened in about the last week or two, people have done something blatantly wrong, and when somebody stood up against it, they tried to backtrack and re-explain what it was, and it was something different, when everybody knows it was not something different. Everybody knows that. Everybody. But it's more convenient not to make waves. The trend takes over. I hope y'all love me tomorrow. When preaching about modesty and proper decorum aggravates you, you slip. We've slipped. Yep. How far? You tell me. You tell me. Listen, and you, you, you definitely may disagree with it. I promise you I'm not. I'm not a legalist. I am not. But the Bible just declares that there ought to be a modesty, and there ought to be, I mean, we ought to conduct ourselves a certain way, and that's just the Bible. That's not legalism. By the way, technically, the, the definition of legalism is work salvation. I'm certainly not that. And, not, and I'm not even the wrong definition of legalism. That I think if you don't wear, you know, wingtip shoes and a black suit and a white shirt and a button-down collar, that you just can't be right with God and you can never preach in the pulpit. Have you ever heard that? I have. It's wrong. I hope it's wrong. Things slip when we drift toward carnal mindedness. When we become quick to make excuses or try to explain things away. When the temporal becomes more important than the eternal. When our opinion matters more than God's truth. When anything takes the place of preeminence away from God. By the way, that is the, the very definition of idolatry. And when anything has a greater priority in your life than God, wow. we've slipped. Wow. Wow. We've slipped. Wow. It's interesting how if He has the priority, everything else falls in place. But we think we have to arrange it so it'll be the way we want to do it. Then we've slipped when we do that. Casualness opens the door to idolatry. Casualness opens the door to laziness. Casualness opens the door to fleshly conflict. You know what casualness will do? If you're casual, one of your favorite words will be but, but, but. And in case you've never noticed, that's not what sheep do, that's what goats do. Some of y'all get that in a minute. It's casual. It's casual. Casualness opens the door for backing up on everything that the Bible stands for. Yes. Casualness is killing the cause of Christ. Right. Amen. And killing, uh, ca casualness is killing the impact of the church. Preacher preached on the impact. Oh, no. And this is the one that ought to scare us all. 
Casualness is no big deal, is it? Not really. But I'll tell you what it does. It opens the door to the devil. Because he's got you going his way. Away from that anchor. Now, simple question. What should we do? When they asked me, what do you have for the young people? And I had a one-word answer, Jesus. I got a one-word answer for this too. Repent. That's what the Bible says. Repentance is something that's not preached about, talked about very much, it seems, anymore. But it is absolutely vital to salvation and and living for the Lord once you are saved. Amen. Absolutely vital. Without repentance, we stay where we are. Yeah. Amen. And we continue slipping away little by little. We don't get closer without a return to where we should be, and we don't return without repentance. Now, I'm going to ask you if you would, if you take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. I want to show you a principle of how we can get this straightened out. Genesis chapter 13 and verse 1. Now, let me t first tell you what's happened. Let me give you the context. Abraham went to Egypt. God never told Abraham to go to Egypt. So what did he do? He pulled up his anchor. And he went. He drifted away from where he should have been. While in Egypt, what did he do? Well, he lied about his wife. And while he was there, you read the, 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 the context of all of this, he really had no fellowship with God. Because there's something interesting that while he was in Egypt, you never hear it mentioned. There was never an altar. Never. But when he comes out of Egypt... In Genesis chapter 13, look at verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. Now, he didn't go south of Egypt. He went to south in the promised land, the southern part of the promised land. All right? And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And, and he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel under the place where his tent had been at the beginning, that's where he was anchored, between Bethel and Hai, under the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. There's, I, I haven't looked. Uh, some of these guys that keep up with all the songs that's in the hymn book. I'm not sure if this hymn's in there or not. Is Back to Bethel in the hymn book? No? You don't think so? Okay. Well, Back to Bethel, that was an old hymn of the faith, and it's really talking about that very thing. When you have drifted away or gone away from where God would have you to go, you've got to go back to Bethel. Think of it this way. Abraham got off track and went to Egypt. He had to get back on track. So he had to go back to where he got off. He left the altar and went to Egypt. He had to go back to the altar. He had to go back to the place where he knew he could fellowship with God, where he had fellowship with God. He had to go back to the place where he knew his anchor was there. And if you can, look at yourself in the mirror and see that you've slipped, I'm telling you, you can go back to Bethel. You can go back to the place where your anchor is there. I'm not talking about losing your salvation when I'm talking about an anchor. You know that. Listen, I, I am anchored within the veil. I mean, I'm, I'm saved, and I'm, you know, I'm going to heaven. But we can drift. We can let these things slip. Hebrews tells us that. Not slipping out of salvation, but slipping out of fellowship. 
And if we do that, we can get back to Bethel. We need to get back to the place where we jumped off, so to speak, or we derailed and get back as we should be. Get back on track from the place where we got off. He got back to the place where the anchor would hold. He got back to the place where the altar was located. He got back to the house of God. That's what the word Bethel means. He got back to the place where God wanted him to be all along. The place where God never wanted him to leave to begin with. Isn't it good that God's long-suffering? Sure. Wow. Amen. Now, maybe he doesn't have to suffer as much with you, but he's got to suffer a lot with me. Yeah. And a real, a real simple way to understand long-suffering is suffering a long time. Mm-hmm. Wow. Jesus said, how I would have, but they wouldn't turn to him. He's long suffering. He's plenteous in mercy. He wants us to be restored to our rightful place. He wants our lives to be fervent, not casual. Listen to God as He reveals to you where you are. I mean, some things you can see, you know, they might be obvious things, but you can really tell if you'll look. Just let God show you. Where are you? You say, well, I'm in church. Well, that's a good place to be. But you could be here and not be here. You can come here casual, you know? It might even cross my mind while I'm here. You know, it won't be long. For I'm getting two scoops of butter pecan ice cream at the UDF. I've been here long enough to know where that is. Good stuff. But if that's what's on my mind, I sure do have a casual approach to the word of God, the house of God, don't I? Casualness progresses in varying degrees and it can manifest itself in different ways but it always takes you away from God so where are we let's just consider where we are personally let us compare our stand with God's stand where are we the pastor mentioned something in a message recently that I thought was so simple yet so profound at the same time that if we would just grasp it then maybe we could understand what casual really means and that's this he says sometimes it's good but it's not great Do you think that if you and I are literally just sold out for God, fervent for God, that that would produce anything less than greatness? And if something less than that's really being produced, we're probably casual. It's not good. Not good to be good sometimes, is it? We ought to be great to the honor to honor God. There's ought to be more to it. Can others see Jesus in you? It's easy in church. Tougher outside. But you ought to be the same out there too. You know. Casual. So we what do you have to do? We talked about it. We have to combat it. You have to fight with it. Because it's so easy to drift. So easy to slip. And then all of a sudden you wonder, how did I end up over here? But I'm telling you, you can get back. 
How did the prodigal son end up in the pig pen one step at a time? But when he came to himself, the Bible says, where did he go? He went back to where he started. That he should have never left, but he went back to where he started. And when he got there, what was there? Everything he needed. And it, and it was there when he left. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a real, just a real short personal illustration, and I'm done. I have three children, two boys and a girl, uh, 40, 38, and 35. Is that right? Is that right? Okay. Uh, uh, Y'all met my oldest boy. He's been here to the church. Uh, when we were raising them, uh, I mean, we had some trouble. I know y'all don't have trouble with your kids. I get that. But we had some troubles along the way. And this is what I told one of my children. I said, I want you to know that I haven't moved. You've moved from where you were. And I'm not going to move to go to where you are now. You're going to have to come back to where I am. I haven't moved away from the church. I haven't moved away from the things of God. I haven't moved away from believing the Bible. And, and he, he'll tell you, he'll, he, he'll tell you, and I'm not going to, by the grace of God. But I said, you'll have to come back if you're going to get back to where you need to be. Same way with all of us. God hasn't moved. And he's not going to move. If you've slipped away, you can come back. He's plenteous in mercy. He'll forgive you. He'll restore you. But you've got to come back. You've got to get back where you got off. It'll change our attitude. It'll change our mindset. It'll change our approach to things. If we get back away from this casual attitude towards God and the things of God and get back on track. Let's all stand, please, if we would. But Dan, if you come play something for us, please. Tonight, if you need to come, you please come. Uh, I'm telling you that whatever's going on in your life is really between you and God and that's where it's got to be settled okay it's got to be settled there and he hasn't moved you'll have to return you'll have to repent you have to come back to him and if you will he'll forgive you he loves you he only wants the best for you and the best is where he is with his standards His righteousness. His word. His commandments. So if you need to come, you please come. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.